do not do these 10 deadly things after diving. Look, scuba diving is a lot of fun and we have important checklists that help keep us safe, such as pre-dive safety, general dive planning, and more. But what about after we dive? In this video, I'll go over 10 things that you cannot do immediately after diving or you'll risk having injury or even death. Let's get into it. As a diver, we learn all about what to do before, during, and after a dive, but we never really dive too deep in what not to do after diving. Here are 10 things that could be deadly if done immediately after diving, and honestly, both beginners and experienced divers need to remember these. As a quick disclaimer, I'll be discussing how long you should wait based off expert recommendations before performing some of these activities, but this is not medical advice. Listen to your body, everyone is different, be safe and use your best judgment. Number one, flying after diving. This is probably the most well-known risk to scuba divers, and there's been different times that have been stated over the years on how long you should wait after diving before you get into an airplane and go flying. The issue here is the pressure change in the airplane as it gets to altitude is actually very much like a rapid ascent. As the plane ascends, the pressure inside the cabin decreases, and you can kind of feel this in your ears actually, as your ears pop or you feel that pressure on your ears as you ascend and descend in an airplane. That decrease in pressure then causes the residual nitrogen in your body tissues to potentially form bubbles because it's such a quick change in atmospheric pressure. And those bubbles can lead to decompression sickness or DCS, also known as the bends. Some people will also say DCI, decompression illness, which is slightly different, but is along the same lines here. Decompression sickness, decompression illness, and the bends, that's kind of a whole separate video topic for another day. As a very safe conservative rule of thumb, people will generally say to try to give yourself 24 hours before getting into a plane after diving, but there are a lot more specific specific recommendations that experts will give to you as well that I'll go over right now. Dan, or Divers Alert Network, is a leader in medical research for scuba diving, and their recommendations are as follows. If you just did a single dive with no decompression, no crazy deep depths or anything like that, then 12 hours before flying is their general recommendation. Again, just for a single dive with no deco at all. For multiple dives in one day or multiple days of diving in a row, for example, on a dive charter or a dive trip where you might be diving for five days straight, they recommend waiting at least 18 hours after your last dive before getting into a plane. For dives that do require a deco stop, say you did a really deep dive or maybe you did a tech dive for example as well, then those ones they actually do recommend the full 24 hours so you can completely off gas as much as possible before getting into an airplane and dealing with that pressure change. Finally, some dive computers have a no fly time as a display metric on the computer itself. And if your computer does have that and support it, go off of that number or the recommendations I just mentioned, whichever is more conservative. So if your computer says 30 hours and you did a deep technical dive, don't wait 24, wait 30. Or if you just did a single dive and your computer says to wait 15 hours or 16 hours, wait 16 hours, don't wait, you know, the smaller amount that I just said a minute ago, 12 hours. Especially with repetitive diving on a dive trip or a charter or something like that, I really recommend giving yourself that full 24 hours if possible and take that time to enjoy the local sites, maybe go on a land excursion, as long as it's not at any type of high altitude, more on that in just a moment. You know, go in and enjoy the sites, stay on the beach, you know, lay out lizard a bit, suntan, that type of thing. Go to a museum. There's a lot of really cool things to see in a lot of these dive destinations. And you don't need to just dive up to that last day. It gives your body time to rest and recover. It gives your gear time to dry out before you get on a plane and allows you to make sure that you're just safe and off-gassing properly before you get into the airplane. Number two, mountain climbing or even driving over the mountains. Now, like I just said, most divers will remember that they're not supposed to fly right after diving, but unfortunately, many of them forget the reason for that is due to the altitude and change in air pressure or atmospheric pressure around them. Unfortunately, mountain climbing or even driving over the mountains might be enough of a change in altitude that the atmospheric pressure will cause you to off-gas faster than normal and therefore again lead to the formation of bubbles from nitrogen that's exiting your body tissues and may lead to decompression sickness or the vents. Now there is a concept of altitude diving which involves doing special types of calculations or adjusting your computer if need be to dive in say a mountain lake for example. So you're diving at altitude where you know basically right below sea level is not sea level anymore. You're going below the surface at a higher altitude so atmospheric pressures change so your nitrogen intake changes. It's a whole specialty in its own and it requires 
probably some extra learning for you. And that's outside the scope of this video. So I won't go too in depth on that. So outside of altitude diving for normal recreational divers that are doing their dives basically at sea level, you need to remember that you need to wait before you do any mountain activities like mountain climbing, for example, or maybe going on a, a long hike over a mountain as well. And you also don't want to go driving over a mountain either. The general rule of thumb here is, you know, ideally you can wait 24 hours before you do an activity like this. So think about that if you're going to a dive site where you drove over a mountain to get down into a valley that has a lake that you're diving in or to get to the coast or something like that, then you might need to consider camping overnight and leaving the next day or the next afternoon so your body has time to off gas properly. All of this also ties into another point that I'll get to a little bit later in the video. So make sure you stick around for that as well. At number three, we have high altitude activities. Okay, so to be fair, yes, this does kind of go in line with the previous point, but I wanted to call this out specifically to add some extra emphasis to it, to some extra activities that you might not even think about when you're on a dive trip. Many divers travel to these amazing places for their dive trips that have all sorts of adventures, outdoor expeditions and excursions, and things that they can take part in outside of diving while they're on their trip. This might include things like zip lining, parachuting, parasailing, paragliding, all the paras in this case, skiing, mountain hiking, mountain biking, uh, different trails, maybe high bridges that you can go on, rope bridges, confidence courses, all these really cool things like that. Now, all of these are great, but the problem here again is that unfortunately, they typically involve a higher altitude, where again, we'll be at a lower atmospheric pressure than sea level. For example, I'm planning a trip to Costa Rica, and not only am I gonna be diving, but I'm planning all sorts of land excursions where I'll be going on these high rope bridges over big big open canyons. I'm gonna be doing a lot of different hiking and I also wanna plan a trip up to the top, as far as I can go at least, to the volcano Arenal, which is one of the famous volcanoes in Costa Rica. I know there's hiking around the volcano and there's also some hot springs I wanna check out too, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the video as well, so stick around for that. But the whole thing is that I'm gonna to have to do this either before I go diving or wait a decent surface interval after I go and do my last dive so I can ensure that I'm safe because again, I'll be at altitude. So similarly to the previous point, the rule of thumb here is that if you can wait at least 24 hours after your final dive, so you can go ahead and do these high altitude excursions, land excursions, expeditions, and things like that, just to give yourself plenty of time to off gas, especially when you have been repeatedly diving. If you've done a lot of repetitive dives, like three or four dives at a resort, and then you go up into the mountains, you know, at the end of the day, you might unfortunately get DCS or the bends just from the altitude and pressure change. So keep that in mind, give yourself plenty of time to off gas. And again, the rule of thumb or general recommendation by experts is ideally 24 hours of time between final dive and that. So you can also start your trip with these expeditions and then go diving afterwards. And that way you get the best of both worlds without having that downtime in between for a surface interval. Number four, deep tissue massages. After a long day or even a week of diving, you can get pretty sore and you know, who just doesn't love a massage in general? Unfortunately, there's some mixed research about how healthy this is for you after you've been diving and specifically when it comes to deep tissue massages. Now, I will say that Dan or Divers Alert Network does say that there's not any specific correlation or confident correlation between massages and decompression sickness. However, just because there's not a confident correlation doesn't mean that there is no correlation and we really need more data and more research to see what that correlation is and how strong of a relationship it is. There are two main issues that some experts will call out when it comes to deep tissue massages and leading to potentially causing decompression sickness, decompression illness, or the beds. First is the increased blood flow that can come after having a deep tissue massage specifically. Those massages are meant to stimulate blood flow, but that increase in blood flow could cause issues with the nitrogen that's in your body. And again, if you form bubbles in that, you might have an increased risk for DCS. The second issue issue here is if you've ever gotten a deep tissue massage, you'll probably relate to this, but those massages can sometimes cause some initial soreness in your muscles, actually. There's a lot of toxins that get purged from the muscles and the tissue around the body as they, they work your body in the massage. And that soreness can actually hide or cause a misdiagnosis uh, or maybe a delayed diagnosis of decompression illness or other serious injuries that happen during your dive. So let's say I went diving, I got bent, I start to have some achy muscles, which is a potentially a sign of DCS. That's something that you wanna monitor. Well, if I go and get a deep tissue massage, then I'm increasing the blood flow, which might cause the problem to be even worse. And then secondly, my whole body might start to ache a little bit because of the massage itself. And then I don't know if that achiness is from the massage or if I'm having joint and muscle pain and other issues because maybe I got bent. 
So the general recommendation here is waiting about 12 hours after diving just before you get your massage that way. So, you know, maybe finish your day of diving and then that night, if you had an, an early morning dive or, you know, finish your day of diving and then the next morning before you start diving, get a, get a massage if you wanted to. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily do a massage and then jump right in the water and go diving because again, deep tissue massages can leave you a little bit sore. But, you know, let's say it's the end of your dive week or something like that. Wait 12 hours, then go get a massage. Number five, hot showers and hot tubs. Now, I know this is probably gonna make me a few enemies out there, but as divers, we really need to wait a little while before we get into hot water, pun intended in this case, uh, by going into a hot shower or into a hot tub or even the hot springs that I mentioned earlier. After we dive, we really need to give ourselves some space and time to kind of warm up naturally. The issue with getting right into a hot shower or into a hot tub or into hot springs, as I mentioned earlier, is our bodies typically cool down as we're diving. I mean, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't know what it is in Celsius, I'll try to remember to put it down here, but our body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and most of us are not diving in 98.6 degree water, which means even in the Caribbean or in Florida or something like that where the water's maybe much warmer, we're still gonna be slowly cooling down as we dive. And unfortunately, the rapid heating up of our body can increase blood flow and cause issues with, you'd guess it, off-gassing where those nitrogen bubbles might form. Those formations of nitrogen bubbles put us at an increased risk of DCS or the bends. Now, while I always appreciate the comments y'all leave and please feel free to type up something to leave it down there. Before you start sending me hate about this, the general rule of thumb is just to wait about 30 minutes before you hop into a warm or hot shower or you know before you get into the hot tub at the resort or something like that, right? So the idea is just kind of giving your body some time to slowly warm up instead of just plunging into hot water right away. Just so that circulation in your body just doesn't kick up right away and again that increase in circulation and blood flow can cause any nitrogen that's in your blood and the bubbles that are there to then become more bubbles and those bubbles again can lead to DCS and all that fun stuff that none of us want to deal with right so 30 minutes or so let me save some face with that give yourself about 30 minutes and then you know take a warm shower not a scalding hot shower but a warm shower and if you really really want that hot hot shower just wait a little bit longer and really think about giving your body that time before you jump right into the hot tub or turn the temperature of the hot tub down if it's your own hot tub for example you know something like that but just warm water, not scalding hot water right away and wait about 30 minutes before that. And then sure, you know, later on you can take an even warmer or hotter shower if you want to. Number six, excessive alcohol. All right, well, I know the last point probably made a good amount of you hate me, but this one's probably gonna make just about everyone hate me. The dive community has a lot of people that have that mentality of, you know, I finished a day of diving, let's go down to the bar and talk about our dives or let's have some drinks after our final drive, right? And there's even the mantra of, you know, your first dive into a beer or your first dive into an alcoholic beverage is your last dive of the day. And what that means is that once you start drinking for the night, you are not to get back in the water that night. And the idea being that alcohol can increase the effectiveness of narcosis. It can increase your impairedness underwater, just like it can with all land activities for that matter. And then of course, it can also do things with your blood and the gases inside your body, which can of course lead to an increased risk of DCS or the bends. Now, as we all know, our bodies need time to off gas slowly and properly before we partake in different activities that put us at a risk for DCS. And if you remember from your training, one of the ways that you can help prevent DCS before diving is to be well hydrated. Well, Alcohol, unfortunately, dehydrates us in every case. So being dehydrated can lead to an increased risk of decompression sickness, or again, the bends. Look, a lot of us enjoy a drink or two after a day of diving, and you know, it's kind of part of the social aspect of diving in some cases, if that's your sort of thing. Of course, you don't have to drink after a dive, and you know, I actually would recommend that you avoid drinking if you can after diving, or at least wait a few hours before you take a beer or two down. And if you're gonna dive the next day especially, you don't wanna be drinking that much anyway. It's much better if you wait a few hours and use that time to get hydrated again after been diving with the dry cotton mouth from your regulator. You know, drink a lot of water, maybe some Gatorade or something like that, hydrate a bit, and then if you wanna have a beer or two with your friends that evening, go for it. Don't go too crazy though, and just remember that 
Drinking in too much excess can also impair our decision making after diving as well, just like it can before diving and in any other time really. So if you're impaired with your decision making, you may not notice the symptoms in your own body. So, you know, maybe DCS is hitting you, you got bent and a few hours after diving, you might have noticed it, but because you've been drinking in excess, you're just not thinking straight and you aren't even really realizing what's going on with your body and you're not noticing the joint pains or the rash or these other symptoms of decompression sickness that, you know, unfortunately could lead to an injury or, or death if you aren't getting taken care of properly. Now, I'm not gonna tell you to just never drink again or never drink after diving, don't go to the bar, all this different stuff. I mean, that's not really my place to tell you what you do with your own decisions there, but I would recommend that you at least wait a couple hours, like I said, before hitting the bar, give yourself time to dry off, take a warm shower, hydrate, change into fresh clothes, and then, you know, after an hour or two's passed, meet up with your dive buddies down at the bar, get a drink or two, and just don't go too crazy because remember, you gotta get up the next morning and go diving again. Number seven, free diving after scuba diving. When I was researching for this video, I gotta say this one was kind of a surprise for me and something I didn't really think about, but now that I've looked into it more, it actually makes total sense. Now, if you're just gonna be casually snorkeling at the surface or maybe just a foot or two down or you know maybe a meter or two down, that's not really a problem. That's not really what we're talking about here, but actual free divers are where the concern's at. And I want you to listen up if you're a free diver. Dan actually calls out two major concerns for free divers when it comes to diving after scuba diving. The first of these I'll talk about in just a moment in my next point, but the second one is that, you know, free divers sometimes go fairly deep. They might be going to, you know, 33 feet or 10 meters, maybe 20 meters or 66 feet at that point. And, you know, that is basically putting atmospheric pressure on their body, just like scuba diving. The risk here is that as we're at the surface after diving, our body has begun to take in that dissolved nitrogen in our body tissues and has started to off gas it through our lungs and through that whole process basically as we start to get rid of the excess nitrogen in our bodies. Again, slowly because we off gas slowly and conservatively and we don't just jump up to altitude or do these other things. Now, the problem is, is that is turning back into a gas and then we're diving at depth as a free diver and we're recompressing that nitrogen and trying to force it back into our tissues again but unfortunately, the way it works is uh, with our processes and our, our cardiovascular system is that might actually then dissolve into the bloodstream instead, which then means when you surface again, the atmospheric pressure is lifted at fairly fast, a uh, fairly fast rate. It would be more of a rapid ascent at that point. And unfortunately, that then means that that uh, nitrogen can form bubbles in your bloodstream now instead, rather than being in the, in the body tissue and going through the lungs, you have bubbles in your bloodstream, which can cause DCS or the bends. Free diving has really grown in popularity lately from what I've seen, and many free divers are also scuba divers. So it's really important that you keep this in mind. And the free diving community has pretty much adopted the same standards as they would for flying when it comes to how long they should wait before they go free diving after they've been scuba diving. This was all part of number one, but I'll just quickly go over them again, just for reference it's been a little bit. If you just did a single dive with no decompression or any issues like that, you should wait about 12 hours before going free diving. If you did two or more dives in a single day, or you did multiple days of back-to-back -back repetitive diving, say again on a dive trip or on a charter or something like that, you should wait 18 hours after your final dive before you go free diving. If you were doing more of a deep dive or a technical dive and you had some deco stops or deep stops that you had to take that were more mandatory requirements because of the depth or the technical limits that you were pushing, then you need to wait at least 24 hours before going free diving. Finally, like I said before with the airplanes, some dive computers do have a no fly time as a metric on the computer. And if your computer has that, go off of that time or the numbers I just said, whichever one is more conservative. So again, if you did a deep or technical dive and you should be waiting 24 hours, but your computer says 20 hours, do the 24 hours. Or in that same scenario, if your computer says 30 hours, wait 30 hours before free diving. Before I move on to the last couple of points, if you're enjoying this content, leave a like and subscribe so I can know that you like this type of content and I'll make more list content like this trying to inform you about more general concerns and things that you need to remember as a diver. Number eight, exercising after diving. Now, I've hinted at this a little bit earlier with the hiking, mountain climbing, zip lining, stuff like that, and even the free diving too, but exercising after diving can actually increase our risk of DCS or decompression sickness. Many of these activities, including free diving and hiking and all of that, include a lot of physical exertion. Physical exertion, especially when it involves heavy use of muscles, maybe rapid limb movements or some joint strain can actually increase the formation of nitrogen bubbles in our 
bloodstreams and can lead to an increased risk of DCS. Dan recommends that you wait four to six hours before doing any type of heavy physical exertion or exercise after diving, but I will say that previously the guidance was 24 hours, so kind of take it for what it is. Yes, the most recent research says four to six hours, but 24 hours was considered a little bit impractical for people to go that long without exercising, you know, if they're also divers. Um, many divers might also be athletic in some way or, you know, outdoor enthusiasts and things like that. So, you know, research has shown that four to six hours is enough time, but you should really probably give yourself as much time as possible after diving up to that 24 hour limit. That was the previous recommendation. Finally, remember that exercise isn't just lifting weights in the gym or doing cardio or something like that. But you know, if you go on a long walk outside where you're up on an incline and you're starting to get a little out of breath or your heart's pumping a lot more, uh, maybe you're just swimming in a pool and you're kind of doing a few laps or something like that. Uh, again, free diving, like I mentioned earlier, hiking, skiing, snowboarding, those are all physical activities. But you know, even things like, hey, you know, we're at a resort on this dive trip, let's play some beach volleyball. Well, you know, beach volleyball is a sport and it is a physical activity and it's just things that you need to think about. And again, waiting four to six hours is the Dan recommendation where previous guidance was up to 24 hours. So your mileage may vary, use your best judgment, see how you feel and just kind of take it easy and, and make your best decision based off your best judgment. Number nine is skipping your surface interval. All right, so we've all been there. You just had an awesome dive. Maybe you saw some sharks or some really cool sea turtles, but you know it was your turn pressure. You were down at the end of your NDL or whatever that might be that limited your dive time. And all you wanna do is swap your tank and jump right back in the water to go back to the, have that encounter or that interaction or go back and see that really cool reef or whatever it was on your dive that is you know making you wanna jump right back in there as fast as you can. Unfortunately, the reality is that we really need to keep our surface intervals in mind. The sad truth of it is I see most recreational divers not actually doing any planning for their dives. They don't use plan mode and say, hey, based off my current dive profile, can I do this next dive to this depth for this long or anything like that, like they should be doing and like they should have been taught in open water. Uh, typically when you're on a charter or if you're just on a, a dive resort or and you're just diving off the boat, you kind of just follow what the guide says and the captain will say, hey, you know, we're gonna do a little 30 minute interval and then get you right back in the water. And people seem to just assume that that's enough time and they don't actually do any math or checking of their dive computer to see if they can do the next dive properly and if that service interval was enough time. Now, ideally you would use the planning mode on your dive computer or tables if you wanted to use those and actually go through and plan your su subsequent dive and say, okay, hey, we just did a dive to 80 feet for you know 45 minutes of a total dive. Um, you know, Based on my computer, it knows all the multiple levels I was at, it has a, a guesstimate of what my nitrogen intake was. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna wait 60 minutes before my next dive as a surface interval. Can I do the next dive to 60 feet for one hour? Is that possible? And your computer will say yes or no if you're still gonna be within your recreational no decompression limits, or if you're gonna be exceeding that and it'll tell you, nope, can't do that. Your max dive time is this. And you can say, okay, well, what if I wait an hour 20 minutes? And it'll say, yeah, hey, hour 20 minutes, yes, that will allow you to do that dive, no problem whatsoever. Now, I will say that most, you know, well-known and respectable charters and, and groups out there, they're gonna make sure you have enough surface interval that you can do to the dive. And you know, what happens is you might get in the water and find that your NDL is super low for some reason, even though you're staying fairly shallow because you've done so much diving for the week. And again, you haven't been giving yourself intervals or, or something like that. Uh, the charter is usually gonna be pretty good about giving you enough time. And just in general, if you're on like a liveaboard, for example, they have to fill the tanks again. It takes time to swap your gear. You know, there's, there's snacks, you go to the bathroom things like that where you're not gonna be just jumping right back in the water typically anyway. But as a rule of thumb, you know, give yourself 30 to 60 minutes if not actually going through and, and please do some dive planning. It's good practice. It's kind of a lot of fun anyway. And trying to, you know, put that on the dive master on the boat or the dive instructor that's on the boat for the charter that you're on or the resort that you're working out of and, and tell them, hey, you know, which side are we going to? What's the planned depth? And how long are we gonna be there? I wanna make sure on my computer that I get a long enough surface interval. And if they're not really doing that, yeah, in recreational diving, you're probably gonna be okay, but do you know for sure? Not really. And you know, again, sometimes these operations and they're gonna have high turnover and they might not always be doing the most safe thing all the time. So just be a responsible diver, plan your dives properly and give yourself some time to off gas on the surface interval. As a last thought here, remember that that surface interval not only gives you time to off gas, but also just gives your body a quick break too. You can hydrate again after that dry cotton mouth from your regulator for the last you know hour dive you were just on. You can grab something to eat real quick to make sure your body's fueled up. We burn a lot of calories while diving. 
And you know, you just give yourself a little bit of a break, stretch out some, that type of thing before you jump right back into the water. Number 10 is ignoring your own body. Now, this one might throw you off a little bit. You might think I'm a bit crazy too, but it is amazing how many people just are not self-aware of their own symptoms and just kind of play something off like it's not a big deal and they just ignore the symptoms that they have when they might be showing signs or symptoms of decompression illness or decompression sickness. Now, I'll have to make a whole separate video about DCS and different symptoms and things like that that can show up, not as medical advice, but just as a general awareness type program. But in general, some things that you can think about for DCS are symptoms like red rashes, numbness, shortness of breath, joint pain, and quite a number of other things that you can look out for too. The problem is many divers just aren't paying attention to their own bodies and they might feel a little bit off, but they're you know disassembling their gear, they're talking to their dive buddies, they're grabbing some food, they're going to the bathroom, maybe the dive day's done, so they got off the boat, they're heading back to their room to change, and then they're getting ready to hit the bar because rather than waiting a few hours like I recommended, they're ready to just go, 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 and you know start grabbing a beer or two. And you know, unfortunately, they're completely ignoring those symptoms and they don't notice the rash. They don't pay attention to the joint pain and recognize it as, hey, this joint pain, wait a second, that's maybe a symptom of DCI. Um, oh, hey, wait a second, I have kind of shortness of breath here. Is that because I'm just a little bit exhausted after a day of diving or do I need to actually worry about this some? Now, to that effect, there might be nothing to worry about at all. You know, if you have a headache, you might just be dehydrated after diving, which is kind of normal and why you should hydrate really well between dives on your surface interval, before you're diving and after you're diving. If you have a rash, it could just be sunburn, right? It doesn't have to be that you have some type of issue under your skin where, you know, it's a sign of DCS. Fatigue, like I just mentioned, shortness of breath, that could just be that, hey, you know, it was a dive and drift and I'm just out of breath. And, and maybe I'm not in the best cardio shape or I'm not in the best health, or maybe it was just a long day of diving and I'm just tired because that happens after you've been diving for a while. But all of that said, the point here is that you should never ignore your own body and those symptoms. You should really look into all of those and investigate those. If something's really not feeling right, make sure you tell at least your dive buddy or your roommate for the resort or the trip you're on or something like that. Or, you know, tell the dive guide, tell, tell the dive operator, the captain of the boat, and you know, if you really feel like something's not feeling right, maybe call a medical professional and see if you can get some help from them or call Dan, Divers Alert Network. Give them a call, tell them what the symptoms are and they can let you know, hey, based off the dive that you just said, these symptoms like, yeah, it sounds like you're just dehydrated. Why don't you check for you know a few hours? If it gets worse, call back, we'll talk to you again, that type of thing. Or you know, if it gets worse, maybe that's when you go seek medical attention. And, and they'll let you know. And I've had this happen where I've had ear clearing problems and I've had a little bit of tinnitus where my ear was ringing. Well, tinnitus is a sign of inner ear barotrauma. So I was a little bit worried about, ah, crap, I don't think I got bent based off the dive that I did, but maybe, maybe I just got some pressure in there. And sure enough, it was just pressure from a blockage due to some sinuses that were blocked up. I was getting over a cold and it had nothing to do with anything else. So the ringing went away after a few hours, didn't need additional medical attention after that. I was totally fine, didn't get bent, but the important thing is that I'm paying attention to my body. I said something to my buddy and I actually called Dan and asked about some medical advice just in case to cover myself and just get another opinion. All right, at this point you might be saying, Thomas, these are great points. I'll take note of them. I'll bookmark the video. I'll share it with my friends that are divers and let them know to remember these points. That's all great. but. What can I do or what should I do after I'm diving? And my answer to that is that there are a lot of fun things you can do, but one thing that every diver should absolutely do when they're done diving is clean and maintain their equipment properly. And if you don't know how to do this, don't worry. In this video, I'll teach you exactly how you can clean and maintain your gear properly. Click or tap the screen now to check that out and I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe, have fun, and let's go diving.